presentation, not at all based on local interaction, but much more global, uh, multi-scale moments. But let me come back to what I was uh, saying. What I was saying is that, essentially, our goal is to understand how to build this presentation. And the key idea will be to try to linearize the symmetry of the problem. So I'm going to, and I said, in most of these problems, there are many symmetries that we know. The most basic one, mm -hmm. translations, small diffeomorphism, you can have deformation on the Heisenberg group of time frequency rotations, phases, and many groups like that. So I'm going to begin with the simplest one, which is translation. And then look at the group of diffeomorphism, which is much more complicated. Now, first I'm going to try to explain what it means to linearize in a weak way. And then we'll look at the Fourier transform, which is the standard tool to linearize actions of groups and see why it's going to fail in this situation. Okay, so you have a group acting, so G is always going to be an element of the group, which is going to act on uh, data, X of U, and the simplest one you can think of is, as I said, translation, so in this case, you are going to have just U minus G, and G is either going to belong to the discrete grid, or if U is a continuous variable, G is going to belong to R squared. That's going to be the representation of the translation groups uh, in two dimensions. That's for translation. For diffeomorphism, if you consider a small uh, deformation, you can write it also as a translation, but now the translation depends upon U. In other words, uh, if you have something like that, you deform it, some points are going to move more. So basically you have a displacement of the different points which is going to depend upon position, okay? G of U. And so G of U is going to be a C1 function. And what you need is that U minus G of U, which is the diffeomorphism should be invertible. So if you consider small deformations, okay, not big ones, one condition you can imp impose for that is that if you look at the Jacobian of U, U, for example, is in 2D, the Jacobian of U has a norm, the largest eigenvalue, which is strictly smaller than one. I will come back to that. So these are two examples. What's the huge difference between these two groups? This group, translation in R2, has two generators, okay? Horizontal vertical translation. G belongs to a two-dimensional space. It's a two-dimensional group. This is going to be an infinite dimensional group because you can see the group element is the set of all possible continuously differentiable function defined over R2 whose Jacobian in that case, because I've put a, a restriction to small diffeomorphism, is more than one. So this is an infinite dimensional space. Yes? But if, if you restrict the gradient, it's not anymore a group. No. I'm looking within my group to the small diffeomorphism. Okay, the group is a diffeomorphism group. So the diffeomorphism group, normally you write it at phi, or let me, if I write it at g of u, where g is a C1 function invertible. I'm considering here the particular function g of u, which is really identity minus g of u, a perturbation around identity. Okay, so I'm just within my group considering the small uh, diffeomorphism. Okay. So what does it mean to uh, linearize? In a weak way, what you would like is that the action of G of U. Now, what is important to realize is that X has absolutely no regularity. So a translation of a Dirac, for example, even a small translation, or a very sharp thing like that, defines you this. And these are two orthogonal functions. OK, the support is not the same. So a small translation can send you very far away in the space, like a, so. What you if x is irregular? What you would like is. Let's uh, question for that. This equality is not an equality, right? It's, uh, what this? Neither of them. Yeah, this is a definition. 
Okay, my definition. This is a action definition is of an action of translation group. It's the action. It's not this, this is the action of translation over X. By definition, oh, I write G, it G dot. Applying, G operator. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's the, the G applying to. So, okay. a G, uh, a group acting on X. Sure. Okay. I will always write it that way, whatever group it is. Okay. In the case of translation, it's X minus U. In the case of a diffeomorphism, it's X, small diffeomorphism minus G of U. Yeah, I should go slow. And what you would like is that this should be equal to, let's say, some function of x plus, and I will write it like that, g acting as a linear operator now <coughs> on some representation. So that's a linear action on some representation phi 1. And what you want is that the representation and the phi one of x be bounded. So that says what? That says basically that the action of G is a constant, and then in that space is going to move linearly, linearly as your representation of the G. That's what you would like to do linearize in that sense. Now, in the case, for example, of translation, in the case of translation, what you have is x of u minus g, and if you go brutally, you may say, okay, this is first order Taylor, u minus g, x prime of u, first order. The only problem is that x is not differentiable, it may be very regular, so you cannot do uh, that kind of thing, but still, it's the spirit. If you want to do that locally, you would like to be able to have some kind of local Taylor series. Let me go now to diffeomorphism. What is, in the case of a translation, what is the size of a translation? The size of the translation is the amplitude of the movement. So basically, it's the modulus, G is an element of R square, so it's the modulus of G in R square. What is the amplitude of a diffeomorphism? To look at the amplitude of a diffeomorphism, take two points, u and u prime. The point u is going to move for a small diffeomorphism to g of, of u minus g of u. u prime is going to move to u prime minus g of u. So, u prime. So, if you look at the distance between these two points, so the distance is going to be g u minus g of u minus u prime minus g of u prime. So, if you are in the case where the Jacobian is bounded by 1, this is going to be bounded by 1 plus the biggest eigenvalue of the Jacobian multiplied by the distance of u minus u prime, because this g of u is going to move u by at most uh, g, uh, the Jacobian multiplied by u, and I let you verify that. 1 minus the gradient Jacobian maximum eigenvalue norm, sorry, the norm of the Jacobian, uh, u minus u prime. So what that means? It means that the amount of deformation, the amount of modification of distances is bounded by this quantity. And this is why this is going to measure for diffeomorphism the amplitude of the diffeomorphism this is called the weak topology of a diffeomorphism. So, the, in the case of <coughs> diffeomorphism, the amplitude that I may write like that of the group, act of the group uh, action here is going to be defined by the Jacobian, the maximum norm of the, uh, the norm, sorry, of the Jacobian matrix. So, what would you like to have? You would like to have that kind of property. That kind of property is like saying what you want is that uh, the increment between x minus the action of x. Uh, so if you go, sorry, this is the phi. I'm sorry. This is phi. Uh, I'm sorry. I, uh, this is when x acts on g. If you look on the phi representation, sorry, this should be phi of x0 plus some in the phi domain, 
the uh, action of g over x should be transported locally linearly. And if you have something which is invariant, invariant means that this condition, this component is going to essentially goes to zero, and you will only have this remaining. So, what you would, to get that kind of property, what you want is that the phi of x, if you essentially look at the action of g <coughs> as a stupid Euclidean norm here. This is now a Euclidean norm over this vector. You should think again, phi of x <laughs> is not a scalar. Phi of x is my representation. So phi of x is going to be a whole vector of descriptor. These were the people called features or that I call here as my change of variable. What I want is my that when g acts over x, my change of variable essentially be Lipschitz rot, and you may have here uh, the norm of x, or if you put, uh, you only consider x of bounded norm that disappear. So that's the kind of condition weak, sorry? Should, should there be a plus sign there? u minus g of u minus u prime yes. plus? Yes. Absolutely, you're right. You'll see I make plenty of mistake all over. So, uh, uh, thanks for uh, thanks for pointing. Don't hesitate. So that's the kind of weak property of linearization that we will at least impose. That means that in our after our change of variable, things go smoothly. The the action of g over your uh, signal is going to be some relatively smooth, and hopefully uh, you can uh, smooth transformation in that space. So, question. So yes. There is no invariance here. No, just move there is no invariance. I don't want to build a priori invariance okay. of a large group smoothness. because I don't know which okay. diffeomorphism are invariant. I can, I will build an invariant of a translation by progressively killing that term, yeah, but the and then I will get. But at this point, the but this point is no invariance. Yeah, it, and in all these games, as I said, the the goal of phi is not to build invariant. You don't know the invariant to begin with. You don't know f. When will you build the invariant? You will build the invariant in the last phase. When you have the phi effects, it's when then you compute this. This is building the invariant. Because this is doing the projection, and you are doing a projection in a high dimensional space. You've linearized your symmetries. Boom, that's where you build. But that's where you do supervised learning. This is going to be done from prior information. OK? So you linearize, but you don't know which one are invariant should be killed or not, and then you kill. OK, so let me now move to Fourier. <coughs> the Fourier transform is the obvious way to linearize the action of a group, and in particular of uh, the translation group. So all this looks not very interesting mathematically and pretty obvious, and I want to explain why that's not the case. <coughs> so if you take the Fourier transform, mm -hmm. so I will put myself with a continuous U because anyway, otherwise I can't define diffeomorphism. So mm -hmm. the uh, Fourier transform is going to be X of U e to the minus I U in a product with the frequency in 2D W is a two dimensional frequency variable. And DU. Okay, now suppose that you translate. Okay, let me go back. I'm in the case of a translation group, so it's x of u minus g. So then I compute the Fourier transform, then the Fourier transform of the action of g over omega. In this case, it's obvious. You have a translation in the Fourier domain, it's just going to do a change of phase e to the minus i g omega. Now, if you take the log of this, log of in the Fourier domain, then you get the log of the modulus of x of omega plus i, the phase that I will write, of x of omega uh, minus i g omega. And what you see is that now the action of G is just a linear operator. 
it within your space after taking the log of the Fourier transform. That's well known. This is a notion of characters over groups. You go over the Fourier domain, and then boom, everything gets very simple in the case of a commutative group. And that's the case. If the group is not commutative, then we cannot define the Fourier transform, but I can here. So everything looks great. I've linearized. And if I want to build an invariant, I just keep the modulus. If I compute the modulus of the Fourier transform, then obviously this is the same than the Fourier transform, the modulus of the Fourier transform of x, because I've just done a change of phase and I have an invariant. OK, why this is never used in pattern recognition, whether it's image processing, whether it's audio? Because it's not stable to deformation. So let me explain that on a simple example. Suppose your, your x has a Fourier transform, which is two bumps. I'm going to put a low frequency bump here. And suppose that x has some high frequencies that I'm going to represent here by a second bump at, let's say, the frequency here omega 0 and a frequency omega 1. Because it's a real signal function, it has a Fourier transform which it is symmetric. OK. Suppose now on x, you do a very simple uh, diffeomorphism. OK, so g acting on x now is not just a translation, it's a translation which depends upon the spatial variable. And I'm going to take a very small trans uh, diffeomorphism, which is just epsilon multiplied by u. In other words, the norm of my diffeomorphism here is epsilon, very small. That's the epsilon is the norm of the grid. OK, so what's going to happen? This is going to be x of u multiplied by 1 minus epsilon. So if I go in the Fourier domain, this is g acting over x in u. If I go in the Fourier domain, I compute the Fourier transform, I have now just a simple dilation. So it's going to be 1 over 1 minus epsilon, the Fourier transform at the frequency omega divided by 1 minus epsilon. You dilate in the spatial domain, it does an inverse dilation in the Fourier domain. What does it mean? It means that a frequency omega 0 here, if I now look at the Fourier transform after deformation, is going to move by to <coughs> uh, omega 0 multiplied by 1. Uh, so for it to have the same value, it has to be omega 0 over 1 minus epsilon. So in other words, it's going to move by epsilon omega 0, because it's, epsilon is small. So the bump is going to move like this. And this bump is going to move also by epsilon omega 1. But now omega 1 is much bigger than omega 0. So the movement is going to be much bigger. Now, I'm going to do it like this. So let's look at now, suppose that this was my representation, phi of x is the Fourier transform. This is, so let me repeat, my representation, oh, I'm in the dead end zone. So the representation phi of x, it's a vector, is going to be the Fourier transform indexed by omega, the set of all modulus Fourier coefficients. What's happening if I compute this? Computing this is like computing the modulus of the Fourier transform minus the modulus of up. Sorry, I'm too small. Now, look, at low frequency, the movement is small. So the difference between these two things may be small. But at high frequency, the movement is very large. So the difference will not be small, even though epsilon is small. Because what is involved is epsilon multiplied by the high frequencies. In other words, high frequencies are completely unstable to deformations, even small dilations. So I let you prove 
that this is going to be always smaller than the norm of grad of G. Bigger, sorry. In other words, what, what is the statement? For any constant C, there exists an X such that this is bigger even if you renormalize by this. Although, in other words, you don't have this Lipschitz property. You are unstable, and you just have to create your X with sufficiently high frequency to have that. Now, when you look at this, you at the same time see what would be the solution. If you now look, can you still see here? Log of omega axis. If instead of considering the omega axis, you consider the log of omega axis. Of a log of omega, how much log of omega moves? Where basically your movement is by epsilon multiplied by omega. So on the log of omega, uh, 1 minus epsilon multiplied by omega, because even over 1 minus epsilon. So this is going to give you log of omega plus log of 1 minus epsilon, and log of 1 over minus epsilon to the first order is epsilon. So over a log of omega axis, okay, this only moves by a constant epsilon, which doesn't depend. But on the log of omega axis, this is y. It moves by epsilon, so it's okay. But this is very narrow. So although it moves by epsilon, the support doesn't intersect. But what does that suggest? It tells you, in fact, you don't have any choice. If you want to have stability to deformation, you cannot be localized in Fourier. And if you want any localization, the natural axis is not omega, but is log of omega. And what is log of omega? You'll see log of omega is scale. So that means you don't want to separate frequencies, but you want to separate scale. And separate scale is what a wavelength transform will do. So basically, stability to diffeomorphism, you don't have the choice, you have to do scale separation, and you are going to end up in the world of wavelet type transform. And let me now move to uh, these wavelet transforms. So that will be the key idea. I'm going to define a split of the frequency axis with which is uniform on the log frequency instead of being uniform over the linear frequency axis. And to do that, you have a tool, basically, which is the wavelet transform. That's what, that, that can be defined as a definition of the wavelet transform. OK, I'm going to still introduce it in lit. You can always introduce things in. So I'm going constantly to go to space to Fourier. So uh, I'll, I'll give papers to point out for the ones who are uh, not used to it. But let me give the key idea of that one doesn't work anymore. Plain red. OK, what is a wavelength? I'm going to begin in one. D. A wavelet is like a sine wave, but it's localized. So it's a function of psi of few like this. And it's an oscillation auditory function like uh, a sine wave, so its integral is equal to zero. Integral equal to zero, that means that the Fourier transform of, OK, I should have said it. Fourier transform, I will always write it with a hat and as a function of omega. So the Fourier transform at the frequency zero of psi of omega is equal to zero because the frequency zero gives you the integral. So it's going to be something like that. Now I'm going to use complex, you know what I'm going to do? Complex wavelets. So they have a real part <coughs> and an imaginary part and analytic function. An analytic function is a function such as the Fourier transform is equal to zero for negative frequencies. And we'll see why. So it almost looks like, a, you'll see, a complex exponential. The only thing is it doesn't have the localization of a complex exponential. So this is how a wavelet is going to look like in the Fourier domain. And then in the spatial domain, it has a real part which looks like that. 
and an imaginary part which oscillates in a position of phase. And you have a kind of envelope like that. So it's your real and imaginary part. Good. So now, how are we going to move this wavelength? We are going to introduce no, a log frequency axis in some sense, and this log frequency axis is a scale parameter. So the simplest thing that you can do is to take a scale which is a power of 2. Then the wavelet transform at a scale 2 to the j will be obtained by dilating your function by 2 to the j. And I'm going to make a normalization like this. This means that when I change j, when j is small, you have a very small wavelet. The support is essentially proportional to, to the j. When j increases, it's like that. And when it increases, it's like that. So large j is low frequency. A small j is high frequency. Now, when you dilate a function in the Fourier domain, it's a dilation, but, but by the inverse factor. So that was your original wavelet. When you, uh, you go to large scale, it's going to compress. So the Fourier transform of this function, I'm going to, I'll explain why, index it by a lambda, and lambda is going to be the inverse of the scale. It's going to be, in fact, uh, the central frequency axis. So if my original wavelet is like that, the Fourier transform, sorry, of the wavelet, you have a dilation, and the Fourier transform is dilated by the inverse factor, so it's going to be psi of omega multiplied by 2 to the j, uh, sorry, yeah, multiplied by 2 to the, uh, the j, which I can write like psi of omega of a lambda. So why? Because basically you see when you increase the scale you get something more compressed, more compressed. When you decrease the scale you go to high frequencies, you get something like this and like this, that's the dilation. And the central frequency of your wavelet is always your <coughs> inverse of scale. So lambda is like... So that's how you cover your frequency axis with wavelet. Now, if you look on the log frequency, then they will all look like having a constant bandwidth. So you can view it as a uniform pavement <coughs> over the log frequency axis, which is what uh, we want. Now, I'm going to do audio applications also. Now, for audio applications, I'm not just going to dilate by factor 2 to the j. 2 to the j, you should think of it as an octave. You see on the piano, you go from one octave to another octave. But when you go from one octave to the other octave, you have intermediate frequencies. I'm going to in introduce these intermediate frequencies by introducing not 2 to the j, but 2 to the j of a q. That means I'm going to put more wavelets. So my wavelet is going to be here, if I look at here, much finer. And I'm going to have several wavelets for each octave. And then you dilate. Why? Because I want more frequency resolutions. And typically, what is Q? Q is going to be, let's say you have uh, 24 half tones, uh, 12 half tones. And you can get Q of the order of 16. That will allow you to distinguish all half tones on a piano, which is the order of magnitude of what you need for the E. Okay, so these are potentially intermediate uh, uh, frequencies. Uh, Stephen, just a point. Uh, Morley was calling that voice. So you have several yeah. number of voice per octave. Yeah. So that's what he was calling the uh, the. There is a whole now. What is interesting in this uh, topic is that it comes from all over. People in audio signal processing have been doing that since <coughs> the seventies and they have their vocabulary. You have people like Jean Marley coming from Sismic that did that from different points of view, Bosman and so on. So there is a, a whole beautiful history uh, of convergence of science around these things that I'm going to skip here because uh, uh, of time and uh, because I want to reach uh, to, to many other things. But there are many, many people who have been involved uh, into, the, uh, into this thing. There's one thing. I haven't yet defined what is a wavelet transfer. A wavelet transform takes an X and computes the convolution of X with all wavelets. So
So what is it doing? A convolution in the Fourier domain, it's a product. So in, four, in uh, signal processing, you call that a filtering. What it really does, it takes your x, whose Fourier transform I'm going to draw here. That's the Fourier transform of x. And it splits it into different channels, into that support, that channel, that channel, and so on. So you can view it as a wave that transform, like a Fourier transform, you divide it into different frequencies, but bands of frequencies, instead of precise frequencies. And the good thing is that because they are localized, you'll see localized structure here. So, and then at the low frequency, you'll need to keep something, and that will be my cutoff scale, we'll see. So I need to keep the average, which are the low frequencies of my function. This is a wavelet transform. Now, if in general, when I have like that an operator with many different components, so here I can look at the norm of the operator acting on x, so on this signal, this will be in this case the norm, the L2 norm of each component. So the first component is a low frequency, and all the other components are the norm of the wavelet channels. And I will show you examples. Now, this operator, and that's an exercise, is going to be unitary if you have a simple property. If for any omega which is positive, if you look at the Fourier transform, basically what you need is that the sum of all this squared covers the frequency axis, that you have no pole in the frequency domain, so that when you project on each channel, you have all the information about x. I'm going to write that condition. It says the Fourier transform of your low pass function plus the sum of the Fourier transform of all the wavelet. There is a one half, and you'll see in the proof when doing it. If this is equal to one, then in fact this is equivalent. You have a if and only if that the norm of w x squared is equal to the norm of x squared. Now this is a two line proof. To prove it, you just apply the Parseval theorem. You just compute that by an integral in the Fourier domain. You multiply by this, you'll see it's really too long. But it's worth doing it because it will give you a feeling of the properties and the splitting of this energy within this different band. OK, so I'm going now to consider that I have my unitary operator. I'm first going to introduce the same thing in 2D before showing you pictures, just to show you that it's the same principle. So in 2D, the only difference is that U is now a two-dimensional variable. But you are going to have the same principle of, yes? Pardon? Ah, pardon. I disagree. Uh, I can rewrite that. Uh, that's what I call the norm of x squared. And the proposition is that uh, this condition is equivalent if for any frequency omega positive you have this, then for any x in L2 of R, you have the energy conservation. Let, let me now do this. Yes. Can you explain again what phi is and reason? Oh, phi, um, oh, you know what? I have an issue of notation here because phi is the same that they phi. I'm sorry. What is phi? Phi is the low pass. Uh, let me not call it phi. Let me. Okay, you have a name, gamma. What is? I'm so used with phi that I'm going to. But I'm going to try. <laughs> it's. You see, you have your wavelets, which are your bandpass filter dilated. And at, you need to cover the zero frequency. And all the wavelets have a Fourier transform equal to zero and zero. So to cover your zero frequency, you need to have a filter, a low pass filter. Imagine it as a Gaussian, which is going to capture your low frequencies. So I suppose that I have this and the condition. So then here it's a gamma is this one. Okay, 
sorry for the speed, but that's the almost only way I can arrive to the interface of what concerns us uh, all over. So get the picture. The picture is I'm not splitting the frequency axis linearly but in log. To do that, I use functions that I dilate and I do convolution with these functions, with these other wavelets. And the property of these functions is, and we'll see that, they are well localized in space and then they are dilated. I'm going to repeat the same thing but in two dimensions. In two dimensions, what is a wavelet? Think of it, so it's going to be a complex function again. And to make it simple, think of it as a Gaussian modulated by sine wave. Okay, so you have a two-dimensional Gaussian, and then you have the real part and the imaginary parts. Then the orientation of the sine wave, let's say, will be or horizontal. I, if I, pl I show it as an image, you will get a zone where your wavelet is non-zero, and it's going to oscillate at a certain frequency. So it is still something which is well localized in space, but now you have a two-dimensional variable, but I don't know how to do it, to draw in 2D. It oscillates like that, and it di dies relatively fast, like this. Now, in 2D, same thing. I'm going to take my wavelet, and I'm going to dilate it. So I'm going to have big wavelet, small wavelets. And here I put the normalization. But... Let me look at the Fourier transform of this. The Fourier transform of this is going to be the Fourier transform of a Gaussian. I modulated it, so translated in a certain psi. So if I look at my Fourier space, my wavelet has a support, so that's the frequency omega 1, omega 2. Now Fourier is a two-dimensional, sorry. Could you take another pencil? Uh, yes, I'm progressively migrating from dark to, yes, to your... That will be needed at work, probably for the next lectures. Yes. Yes. Otherwise, uh, green is visible? Yes. Good. So, the Fourier transform of the wavelet is going to be a blob, let's say, like this. Okay. You dilate it. So in the Fourier domain, it's a dilation. So the blob is going to look like, uh, like this. And then larger blobs, larger blobs. OK, what you need is to cover the frequency axis, the uh, plane. This is not enough. What will you need to do? Well, one way is to rotate these things. So what we're going to also introduce is a rotation variable. So now the wavelet is going to be, I'm still going to put a lambda. And the lambda depends upon the scale and the rotation. What's happening if you rotate a function in special domain? In the Fourier domain, it's also rotating. So if you take your wavelet at a given scale, you rotate it. You're going to get that, that, this, this. These are all the rotation. Typically, you need whatever for, let's say, eight rotations. Now you take this one, you rotate it like this because it's big, dilated it will still cover your circle. And this one up covers. And the small one. And what you see is that, I'm sorry, the center is there. You completely cover the frequency axis with a dilation and a rotation. Okay, these are my parameters. And what is lambda? If this was lambda, is the center frequency of each of these wavelengths. And it depends upon two to the j and theta. Now the rest is the same. You take x, you split x within each of these channels by making your convolution with your wavelet. And the only thing that you're going to miss is the middle, the low frequencies. And the low frequency, I'm going to capture it with my gamma, which is in some sense a low dimension a Gaussian at this scale. And now the proposition is exactly identical. If you have, so you have that, this is true, but omega is now a two-dimensional uh, two variable on the half-plane. 
So the proposition remains the same. OK, so what I get out of all this is this wavelet transform. And now I'm going to show images, because otherwise it Ah, le, ah, il est là. Gamma J is a dilated at the cutoff scale. I will come back to that. It's a fixed function dilated also. But the, the amount of dilation depends upon how far you went with the other wavelength. I will come back to this. OK. This is a wavelet transform of an audio signal. So I'm sorry. This is the audio signal down. It's a waveform x of t, what's called t. That's u time. Now. That's the log frequency axis, so that's my parameter. And for any lambda, I compute the convolution of x with a wavelet. So I get this. And here I've shown only the modulus, the, the modulus of this quantity. And what you see is what is called a log spectrogram. You see appearing harmonics like that, because that was an audio, uh, I think it was a clarinet signal, something like that. You see the different musical notes, which appears along this lambda. Lambda is going to be equivalent to your channel in your, uh, in your deep net. You will see how this lambda relates to. Basically, what you did is you took your function, which was a function of u, and you are now represented in a higher dimensional space. It's not anymore a function of u, but you've introduced this fiber, which represents the dilation group in particular here. And for each of them, you have this coefficient, and you see this image now, which represents the signal. Here I'm just showing the modulus. Okay, So that's the uh, wavelet transform. Now, this wavelet transform happens to, as I said, to be studied since the 70s, because in fact, that's exactly what is done by the cochlea. Inside your ear, you have a small organ, which is called the cochlea, which takes the input uh, pressure waves, splits it into frequency bands, which are dilated, which are essentially these wavelets. And then, what is interesting, in there is a whole set of further processing, obviously, in the audio cortex, which is doing things which, in fact, are similar to, in a first approximation, uh, filtering and nonlinearities. What we see appearing in the audio cortex, and when I say we, it's not me. There was a lot of experiments we working with people at ENS, in fact, in neurophysiology, is that there is a form of linearization of invariant of major transformation, in particular deformation and uh, translation in time. Let me go to images. These are wavelets in 2D. That's my wavelet, the real part, imaginary part, localized sine wave. If you compress, dilate it, that's what you see. And if you rotate, that's how it's going to look like. If you represent it in the Fourier domain, that's the Fourier transform. You rotate, dilate, that's what you get, and that's what we get. OK. Same thing, similarity. Since the 80s, people have been observing that in the audio cortex, in V1, so that's in the back of your mind, that's the first zone of uh, uh, the vision. Eubel and Wiesel got the Nobel <laughs> Prize for showing that there are cells which, in a first approximation, behave linearly. People have been uh, spending a lot of time measuring the impulse response of these linear operators. And they are organized in hypercolumns. And if you look at this hypercolumn, you observe filters which are dilated, a bit like wavelets, with different orientations, with a most fixed or number of orientation which turns around these center wheels. And these are wavelets that were measured from uh, neurophysiological data. And then later, you see appearing very nonlinear phenomena and appear apparition of what are called complex cells and invariants. Let me skip. 
This is the way they transform of an image. So you have, this is the image. This is one particular scale, fine scale, okay? Filtered with real and imaginary part. I'm separating here the modulus, and here I'm separating the phase of this quantity. That's a different orientation. This is the orientation of the wavelet, so you see it rather extract vertical edges. Because the wavelet is localized, you see what each of these coefficients is a convolution. If the wavelet is located near an edge, because the wavelet oscillates, boom, you have a large coefficient. Okay? If it's located in a zone where the image is nearly constant, because the average of the wavelet is zero, the coefficient will be zero. Black, white, large amplitude coefficient and you see essentially horizontal, vertical type edges, and then you have the phase. And then you do that at different scale, you see the edges are a bit more blurry, and you can do that at all scale and all phase. Okay, the culture in harmonic analysis is basically, in, on the math side, forget about phase. Phase is complicated, you always want to take the phase, retransform it so that it appears as a modulus uh, information. I'll show that was a big, in fact, now it's a mistake. But we'll begin that way, and we'll, we'll have quite some knowledge that way. What is very nice with these wavelet coefficients and the modulus is that if you just look at the amplitude of these coefficients across scale, you characterize singularities, the type of singularities, where they are, and so on. I'll come back to phase, but later. This is turbulence. This is the phase of the turbulence where you see the geometry, the different modulus coefficients. Now, how is it calculated? It's calculated, there are fast algorithms, and that's why we're going to get a bit closer to deep net, with a sequence of filtering subsampling. So you take your image, you first extract the high frequency wavelet coefficient with a bunch of very small filters, and then the low frequency. And then you subsample and you repeat. Filter with small, you get the next scale wavelet coefficient, low frequency. And you repeat. And that was the kind of thing studied in the 90s <coughs> called filter banks all over signal processing. There was thousands and thousands on papers of how to do that. Now, this is entirely linear. Okay, it's just a succession of filtering, subsampling, filtering, subsampling. And you can see this depth, this is scale. Because the more you filter, the more you increase the width of your wavelength. And here I'm just showing the modulus. Okay? Good. So let's go back to the blackboard. So that gives you an intuition of what. Okay, so now I want to drink it. Not yet. Not yet. Yes, I'm going to show when it, 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 it it's not yet similar. Uh, there are many, at that point it's not. And it's entirely linear, which a deep net are not. Ça s'arrête ou non? Il n'a pas compris. Encore. Ah oui, là il est. Ok, now I'm going to. Normally you say, thank you for your question, I'm now going to answer it. Uh, and I'm going to try to address that precise question, what's the relation now with the with deep net? So, to address this question, I'm, I'm going to first look, and that's what uh, leads, will lead to deep net. How do you build invariant with that kind of structures? And how do you linearize translation diffeomorphism? So I said, a priori, they are well, well uh, structured to be stable to diffeomorphism because they have this uniform uh, width over a log frequency axis. Let me now go to the issue of invariance to translation or linearization. 
or invariance to translation. Okay. Suppose you have an X, I'm going to do it in 1D, which is has strong singularities. Okay? You want to, for any X of you, suppose you want to impose an invariant to make it uh, simple to it, which is a linear operator. Invariant to translation. You don't have the choice. The only invariant to translation which is linear is obtained by averaging along u. This is very natural. What is u? This is the translation, in fact, axis. If you want to be invariant to translation or to the action of a group with a linear operator, what you need to do is to average along the orbit. Now, in that case, it will amount to average along u. Now, let me do a local averaging. This is where my gamma is going to appear. So think of gamma as a Gaussian, and you average locally with a Gaussian, so you're going to get something like this. Okay? Two to the gamma has J, I'm going to build it by dilating a gamma, which is a Gaussian. So to answer your question, you can take a single Gaussian, you dilate it. Two to the J will be my base frequency, okay? And what's happening? Two to the J is of that order. As long as the translation is small relatively to two to the J, the translation will, be, will not affect too much the value. And if I now define the translation this way, x of u minus g, if I look at a transformation which just makes a convolution with the gamma, what I'm saying is that this is going to linearize translations which are small relatively to gamma. Why? Because if I do, that's just Taylor. Gx convolve with gamma. <coughs> this is now a regular function. I can do a Taylor expansion. So the Taylor expansion in the neighborhood of uh, u0 is going to be gx, so it's going to be, sorry, x convolve with gamma in u0. And then I'm going to have minus g, the derivative of this, and the derivative of this is x convolve with gamma prime in u0. And because gamma is very regular, the gamma prime is going to be uh, small. You are going to have a locally local translation. Now, if you let j go to infinity, this is going to so going to converge to a constant. This is going to disappear, and this is going to converge to the integral of u of x dx. And this is the invariance that you can get. So, invariance with linear operator is quite obvious. You just average. The obvious problem is when you do that, you lose all the information. So our problem is to linearize or to build environment, but not lose information. Where is the information that was lost? The information that was lost is all the high frequency that I killed. So think of it. Of it. You began by averaging like that. Where are the high frequencies? Well, the high frequencies, you can capture them with wavelet coefficients. Why with wavelet coefficient rather than Fourier? Because you want to be stable to deformations. So that's where, sorry? Yeah, so to be clear, what are you, I mean, so, so the invariance is, the translation is imposed on what object here? Because, I mean, I could, I could just- The invariance? The signal, right? Yes, the invariance is imposed on X. So if I take, for example, this quantity, okay? This quantity depends upon x and is invariant by translation. So I can define, let's say, a phi x, which is this representation, has only one factor. It's invariant by translation. So it's only on operators that act on x on one Yes, it's, the yeah. Time. The okay. invariants are going to be the phi of x. That's how I'm going to build invariants, or that's how I'm going to linearize. So the phi is a non in general nonlinear operator. But the first thing that I began is by saying, let's suppose it's linear. How far can I go? And how far I can go if it's linear and I want to build an environment, that's how far I can go, okay? 
Now, then I can see where I've lost information. The information I've lost are in the high frequencies. Okay. The problem of the high frequencies, how does this look like? Well, this is going to look like something zero, and then which is going to oscillate near uh, the singularities, like that, with a real imaginary part. So you could say, okay, well, then let's compute an invariant by integrating that. Why is this, by the way, invariant? Because convolution is covariant. And if you integrate something which is covariant, you get something which is invariant. So this is invariant. But what is the problem? This is zero. This is zero because I let you verify because the integral of this is zero. So yes, it's invariant, but you just get zeros. You can't do better than the other. If you want to do better, you have to move to nonlinearities. So if you've been raised in the harmonic analysis, nonlinearities, you say, OK, I have the imaginarity and uh, real part. You take the envelope. The envelope, what is it? It's the modulus of this. OK? Now, once you've computed the modulus, now you can build a new invariant. Why? Because now this modulus, if I integrate it, I have something which is different than zero. Why is it invariant? Sorry? Why is it invariant? Because it's covariant to translation. Convolution is covariant. The modulus makes it covariant. So it's the whole thing is invariant. Now, if I average the modulus great, I'm going to have a number. And that's, I'm killing all the, sorry. So, if I do that, I'm going to kill a lot of information. How can I recover the information that I kill? Well, I should recover the high frequencies of the envelope. So, in other words, what I did here, if I, I could, is from this, I said, OK, let me take this and now compute an invariant or linearize that quantity by averaging it on the large domain. But if I do that same thing, I've lost a lot of information. How can I recover the lost information? Well, I can take this quantity and, let's call that lambda 1, compute its high frequencies by convolution with another wavelength. And I want to make an invariant out of that. This has a zero average. I cannot average it. So I'm going to make a modulus. And I'm going to average it. And I'm going to repeat it. Because if I average that, then I've lost information. What information I've lost? The high frequency of this quantity, and so on. And now I'm going to arrive to a deep net. So I'm computing. And I'm going to re-explain that most slowly, in a deep net words. I begin with S, which is here. I do an averaging, an averaging in a, I'm going to, here this is going to be the scale axis. And that's the scale to the J. I average more, 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 more. I get here x convolved with gamma g. The information that I've lost, I get it with the high frequencies. These are the wavelet coefficients. And at each scale, I have this. OK. Now, this is a li my linear operator. OK. Now, I put a modulus on each of these coefficients. <coughs> now, I take this coefficient and I average it. Basically, it amounts to bring it down in my tree. But I don't want to lose the information, so I'm going to compute the wavelet coefficient of this quantity. So that's going to be x convolved the wavelet, and I extract the second uh, one. And I put my nonlinearity. That's my row, my nonlinearity, punctual nonlinearity. And I do that for all of them. 
and then this is here I want to make it invariant. I want basically invariant means I want to build to bring it to the low scale to the bottom of the tree. I lose information I get the information that I've lost here and boom I do it and I bring it back. Now what did I do? I began with X. I computed the first wavelet transform. That was my first tree. And then I've calculated the modulus. So really the operator is the wavelet transform, then taking the modulus. Then a second wavelet transform. I, I'm not going to put, write it like that. I'm going to write it like that, the modulus operator, the nonlinearity. Second wavelet transform, nonlinearity. Third wavelet transform, nonlinearities, and so on, up to the last Nonlinearity. There is two. What, it, what is confusing is that there is two ways to do it. In diagonal, is that the way they transform, or layer per layer, and this is the filter bank view. Layer per layer, these are the layers of your deep net. Very simplified deep net. I should insist, and I'll come back to that. But basically, you do a sequence of filtering nonlinearity, filtering nonlinearity, filtering nonlinearity, and so on. And the bottom will be what. I was calling scattering coefficient. So why scattering? Because it's a, you see, what you do is you begin from an X and your X, you make it interfere in some sense with wavelengths. Then you collapse this interference, you compute, and at the bottom you have the average. I'm sorry, it's a gamma so use. And then you take that and you explode it again with a new set of wavelets. And this quantity you re-explode it. And at the bottom of the tree you have all your sequence of convolutions with your wavelets. And so on. So in some sense, you are exploding things progressively. And the bottom of the tree is like the detector. That's where you gather all what you had after this succession of interactions. And I will explain that more. Now, let me immediately say in what sense it's not at all a very rich deep net. You see, it's like it's a tree. These are the channel parameter that I mentioned and I have no interactions between the channels. I only do convolution in space. Yes? So for each, at each level, you have all of the de dilation and all the rotation, or you have different scales? No, each level that? corresponds to one dilation. That's the scale axis. And when I move from level to level, it's the scale which changes. OK, and so the different mm -hmm. children of one nodes are mm -hmm. just the rotations? Or yes, okay. exactly. These are the different rotations. And you go to the next scale, different rotations. And so. Now, no interactions here. No interaction, why? Because I only worked until now on the translation group. So I don't just do convolution on the translation group. When are we going to introduce interaction? When we're going to try to linearize other groups. And that will be done through transformation along these lines. But, for example, along rotations. Or we'll see later with space. OK, so that's a kind of convolutional tree. So what are the properties of this thing? How far can you go? So it's a, a little bit, as I said, like a deep net in the sense that it has a structure, but it's simplified because I have no interaction. And the filters, they are not learned. They are fixed in advance by the fact that you want to build a wavelet, and boom, you derive all your filters. So before showing how it compares with deep net for classification and so on. Let's look a little bit at the properties of this operator. So I constructed here an operator which is very nonlinear, which associates to an x a vector each of these channels are what you get at the output of your, this is what you get, Sx at a given scale, given depth. All these are signals that depend upon you. 
obviously they can be subsampled because you have this averaging, but I'm going to forget about that. And you would like to know, you have, you know, you've taken one signal, you exploded it in many of them, which are smaller because you can subsample. What are the property of this thing? I'm going to, each of these things, I'm going just to introduce a notation. You see a coefficient here, you get it by going along a path. Okay, I'm going to call P this path. So a coefficient here is a coefficient SP of X. It's a coefficient that I obtained along a path and an SP of X, these are the different SP of X. So what is P? P, the path variable, is a succession of, they are characterized by the succession of lambda one, lambda two, and so on. So this is why, I, I mean, at the time I was working on that, there was a physicist doing high uh, energy physics. Who said, ah, it looks a bit like a scattering phenomena where you have a pass in the uh, Feynman diagram. I have no idea whether it has really any relation, but the fact is you have this succession of operations. In that case, because you have a tree, you have a path, so that will be easier for the mass to consider this path variable. Okay, what are the property of this transformation? This transformation, as I said, was obtained, I wrote it here, I'm going to rewrite it, really by taking the wavelet transform, apply the modulus, second wavelet transform, apply the modulus, and so on. But remember, W1 is a unitary operator. It preserves the distance. <coughs> now, rho here, it's the modulus. So if you take the modulus of two number, modulus of A minus modulus of B, this is smaller, obviously, than modulus of A minus B. So the modulus kills the phase, it's a contractive operator. So you have a unitary operator and a contractive operator. So this I'm going to write it, modulus of omega one. These operators are contracted. Modulus of mo omega one X minus modulus of omega one X prime in no this is going to be smaller than x minus x prime. So what are you doing? You are cascading contractive operator. If you cascade contractive operator, this is going to be contracted. So the first property you are going to get is that you have a contractive operator. When I mean sx minus sx prime, this is my phi, my representation phi now. Phi x, I mean the, norm, the sum of the difference term by term. Okay, so this is really the sum over all P of the norm of the channel P minus the channel P of X prime. So you have something contracted. Okay, that gives stability. The second property you can easily verify because this preserves the norm and absolute value preserves the norm is that the norm of what you get at the bottom is the norm of x. So if you look at the energy of what you have here, it has the energy of what you had at the beginning. So you haven't lost energy in this propagation phenomenon. <coughs> what is really interesting is not so much this, it's the stability to deformation. For any x in L2, for any g in C1, such that the grade of G is smaller than 1, small deformation. If you look at the scattering transform of Gx minus the transform of X, this in Euclidean norm, so in your space, this is going to be smaller than a constant, right, G. And if you haven't normalized that, you put the norm of X here. So why is that? So what that means is that you have basically regularized your diffeomorphism. Why is that the case? Because each time you are cascading an operator W, 
which is a wavelet transform. And the wavelet transform is stable to deformation. So the way you prove, and this is the most delicate thing to prove, is you look at the commutator. When you look at the action of G over X and a wavelet transform, minus some action, the action of a deformation of each of the wavelet coefficients, this is smaller than so what that means is that the wavelet transform operator almost <coughs> commutes with deformation up to the amplitude of the deformation and it's because of this commutation property and to get this commutation property you don't have the choice you need to separate scale you need to have something like uh, a wavelet transform that you get this stability to deformation. So, what I want to illustrate now is that once you have this, you can simply solve problems which are essentially driven by translation and deformation. Why? Because in this space, now, things will look like linear transformation. So in this space, if you have a problem where the discrimination can be based on, or the, the, the source of variabilities that you want to kill are essentially translation deformations, the only thing that you'll need to do is take your two classes, let's say, like that, which initially are mixed. You go here. And normally they should be separated because, well, normally, not normally. You hope that you're going to project on the direction W, so you're going to compute this inner product. And by doing that, you are building invariance to specific translation, specific deformation that are not useful to discriminate the two you lower the dimension of your problem and you adjust the weight to be discriminated. So I'm going to show that. This is again going back to standard kernel or linear regression. The important thing here is the linearization of the uh, of the symmetries of the problem. So let me Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going now to give some, before doing that, uh, give another intuition of what's happening with these coefficients. And so I'm going to show a whole series of slides. Ça s'allume? Ah oui, I'm going to first repeat what, all what I said with pictures. So, and then I'll show the classification. First, wavelet transform. You take your x, you convolve, take this convolution. What it means? You take your signal, you take your wavelet, which is a locally oscillatory function, and you compute the integrals. Where is the integral going to be large? Near sharp transitions. Here they are. Okay, and you take the modulus, and boom, you, your <laughs> modulus points to large amplitude coefficient. That was the basis of all what was done on wavelets in the 90s, and that's how you detect your singularity. Now, you would like to understand the geometry of this set of large amplitude coefficient. This is the geometry of the edges in some sense. What do you do? You send a new wavelength on this thing. You make a convolution with a new wavelet. So you don't need to use a very fine wavelet because this is a regular bump. It's going to be more interesting to send the important one will be the large size wavelet. What are you doing? You are looking at the interference of these different terms with a waveform. 
You take this, boom, you compute the modulus, and the modulus capture the interferences of the different sharp structure in your signal. And you take the average. Let me show that with audio signal. This was the wavelength coefficient, OK? And you see, in some sense, the harmonic where you have some very high frequencies. You're going to build the environment by averaging, averaging in time. You've seen, you lost everything. You've lost all the time structure. You need to recover this time to structure. How do you do it? You, for each line here, you compute the variability by computing the wavelet transform. So you create a new axis, and this is going now to be transformed at different scale into this thing. You do it for each of them. And see what happens. First, you have a representation in space. You create a new first fiber, which is your log frequency. You have a 2D. And then a second one, because now you want to know the variability within each of these frequencies, you have this. Now, from this, you average. You average, and all these quantities are invariants, OK? These are my invariants. They don't change in space. But this, because you've averaged, you want to further transform it. For now, all the transformation were just done in time. What will happen then is that you'll have transformation along this axis as well because you want to capture the geometry along frequency. You want to capture, for example, what is the notion of neighborhood in a situation like that, to, to relate it to what Mark was saying? You see, this point and this point, they are neighbors, because these are the next two harmonics. So the neighborhood is not the frequency, but it has a different topology. There is a different underlying group, which is related to the notion of harmonics, which is well known in music. I mean, in music, you have the notion of harmony, you have the notion of chords, all this is based on the discrete group structure related to harmonics. Okay, so these are the groups which are going a priori to appear. <coughs> Same thing for, okay, let me now give you a sound. Okay, you're going to sit here. Attack, tremolo, vibrato, okay? This is the wavelet coefficients that I averaged. Sorry, this is my gamma. So because I average these things in space to make local invariants, I'm losing all the structure. This structure, if you look at the second order coefficient, you see it. The attack was very smooth. You see there is no high frequency along lambda 2. The attack was sharp. So when you do a wavelet transform along that, boom, you see it. Here you have a tremolo. You see appearing the frequency of the tremolo. Here you have a vibrato, it creates harmonics on the second layer. If you just have this layer, you're dead. You, you are not able to recognize, differentiate these different structures. Oh. oh, sorry. Okay, now same thing with noise. These are the representation here. They are all the same. Essentially, the power spectrum of, of all these structures are identical. And you see the structure appearing at the second layer, second order coefficient. That's like equivalent of higher order moments. What is the big difference with higher order moments? All the operators we've been using are contracted. You have no explosion. So the uh, variance of the estimators, and that's key in these deep networks. This is two different signals the Gaussian equivalent. They have exactly the same power spectrum. But you can see the intermittency in some sense is very different. First order, they are identical. Second order, you see the high energy due to this strong variability that you don't have here. So you can see that, OK. Then you have the contraction properties. So that's the intuition. Now, we move to classification. So, this is the most simple problem, in some sense, that has been around to try to test classification algorithm for images. So you want, each of these is an image, and you want to recognize what digit it is. Is it a 6, a 7, a 9, and you have all, all kind of ha handwritten. You have 
a database to train and then a database to, to, to test and that's completely standardized. So, what are the main variability here? Your digit can move in your image and it's going to be deformed. So, if you have a transformation which linearizes tr translation deformation with a simple linear operator, you should be able to kill the variability which is useless and recognize the ones and uh, keep the ones which are important. So, if you do that with a convolutional network where you learn everything, in this uh, problem, the error is of a 0.4%, which was improving by a factor 3 what was obtained before with uh, uh, standard kernels such as Gaussian kernel and so on, which do work well. They have an error of about 1.2%, but worse than that. In this case, we know everything about the nature of the groups. So we can implement it. So in this case, we implement it with a scattering transform. You get exactly the same error. The difference is that now you can use it with much smaller data set because you don't have to learn the whole network. You don't do better because the convolution network had a lot of. You do better if you have a small data set to learn. But if the data set is very large, what is remarkable is that, in fact, the, net, the deep net is able to learn it. Remarkable, yes and no, because now if you look at the architecture in the deep net, everything is there to do it. How is the deep net structured? A cascade of small filters one after the other. So it imposes scale separation. Because the filters are small, it imposes stability to deformation in the architecture. But it's able to learn the filters and get the result. Texture recognition. So this is a database of texture. There are many like that, where you have, uh, I think, 60 uh, different classes of textures which have of material with different illumination, different structures. These are different examples of a texture within a class. Th these are different textures. You want to do the same thing. So classification, in other words, you are given a texture, one example. You want to find what texture it is. This amounts to identify a random process from a single realization. You have different random processes, which corresponds to your different textures. You have one realization of your random process, and you want to find from which random process it comes from. And you have training. So the standard approach is, the for, is to use, it's a stationary process, is to use second order moment, Fourier spectrum. If you do it well, you get very nice results. You have an error of the order of 1% over this database. But within this database happen to be textures which had exactly the same second order moments. So if there you are dead. You can't discriminate that. Here, because of these second order moments, what I showed is able to measure these intermediacy phenomena. The error is decreased here by a factor of about 5. So you get 0.2%. Uh, and in general, in textures, these kind of things have a tendency to work very well. I'll come back to that. But where it doesn't work, and that's really the most interesting thing. If now you give a database much more structured, cars, dogs, ships, this is a simple database like that called CIFARTEP. If you apply this transformation, the error here is about 20%. The error with deep net is three times small, about 7%. Why? This means that somewhere the deep net has learned structure that we're not there. And so the whole question is to understand, are these structures related to the particular shape of the cars, of the dogs, of the ships, and so on? Or are there some symmetries that we haven't yet incorporated, which we could know by analyzing in a little bit deeper the environment, which would be sufficient to obtain that thing. And that will be essentially what I will go to uh, in, the next, uh, um, in the next presentation. At this point, there is no results on that. To take an easier road, and I'm going to finish on that, but I would like just to do the link with uh, uh, what Mark did. 
I'm going to come back to the problem of representation of stochastic processes. Ça s'éteint? No. Ah, faut le faire. Ah, voilà. You see, the problem of classifications or regressions are very difficult because you get a result, it's better, it's worse, it's very hard to know why because the output is a number which is better or worse and it's very difficult to get any intuition about what you did wrong. The problem of modelization of stochastic processes is much better from that point of view because if you do a wrong model of a stochastic process, you can sample your model, look at the realization, and see the kind of properties that you haven't been able to capture. So you have a feedback over your problem, which is much stronger. So I'm just going to introduce, and I will develop that the next time, how this relates to the kind of thing that Mark was speaking and the type of question we can ask. So, the represent suppose we have a stationary process X of U. The representation we've been computing are, and I'm now going to move to a discrete grid. So the in so, well, let me first write it. It's X convolved with, so it's basically an, a large scale averaging of X. And then the wavelet transform of X averaged. And the second order wavelet transform. So you have one scale and the interference. What is Okay, what is really different relatively, maybe I should say, with what we did before with wavelength? Before we were just exploding that. What is really different, which comes from these ideas of deep net, is that now we look at interference between different scales. And I will come back to that. But I want to, before, make the point, um, finish on the point on the relation with what Mark was speaking about. And, and so on. Now, Suppose you have a little bit of ergodicity <laughs> property. In other words, suppose that you have some decorrelation, suppose that you have an integral scale. What are you doing? You are taking a stationary process, you make a convolution. This is still stationary. You take the modulus, this is still stationary. And then you make the average. What you can hope is that this is going to converge to the expected value of this, x, the expected value of x convolved with the wavelets, the expected value of x convolved with the first wavelet and the second wavelet. So in other words, you are computing moments. This is the expected value of your representation. So in a stochastic framework, if you think of the bottom of your tree, it's giving you estimation of moments. And if the size of your image d is going to infinity, and you average over the whole size, then, and I'm going to average to the maximum size. So in other words, I'm going to rewrite that. This is going to be the sum over all x of u. This is going to be the sum of the convolution with the wavelet over all x of u, and so on second wavelet. This is what I'm doing if I make an averaging over the whole image domain. The gamma is just averaging all over. <coughs> How can you read that? This, in fact, it's the scattering uh, transformation. S, it is really a sum over U of a potential which is very nonlinear, which is this. What is this potential? The potential 
that you have here are first x, x convo is the first wavelet coefficient, x convo is one wavelet coefficient, and the second wavelet coefficient, and so on. Okay? Now, what's the big, what's the difference with the kind of thing that Mark was uh, describing is that in some sense that will be the equivalent of my energy. It's not one coefficient, but it's a vector. Why it's a vector? Because then from that, you are going to build, if you know these moments, the different values, let's say, of mu, if you make a maximum entropy, you will be able to compute a Gibbs energy of that form. And all the scattering coefficients. And the question will be, how good this is to model physical phenomena? The difference is that I'm not here change essentially the only thing that I'm changing are the regression coefficient which are here my Lagrange multiplier and the question is can I get easy from that can I get turbulence just by changing the beta if I look at the beta can I recognize the phase transition look at this Hamiltonian this is a completely multi-scale Hamiltonian you have separated the scale You've looked at all interactions between the scale, and you should be able to get your critical exponent by just reading, because the critical, and that's where you see appearing directly the renormalization group ideas, because you are exploding things. But here you're going much further, because you are looking at the interaction between scale, the goal being not to do easing. Every, I mean, people know how to do easing, even though there are still mysteries in 3D. The goal is to go much beyond easing, and do things like turbulence. So, there will be two problems to do that. The first problem is you cannot compute almost numerically the Lagrange multiplier. Because to compute the Lagrange multipliers, as Mark was saying, you need to do a simulating and editing, a metropolis testing type algorithm. It's very heavy because here, the number of variables you have is of the order of thousands. So you have to simulate them, do the uh, stochastic descent of the metropolis has things over it, very, very slow. The way you can do that is by taking a different road, which is indirectly the road that was taken by people numerically in deep net, which is, that's the macro-canonical approach. It's a microcanonical approach. The difference between the macrocanonical and microcanonical approach is that you get one observation x1, and from this single observation, it defines a set of states which have similar observable, and then you try to uh, maximize the entropy without computing the Lagrange multiplier. So these will be the topics of next time, and what we'll see is that it fails to do turbulence. It looks OK, but far from perfect. And so the question will be, what are we missing? What is the group that we are missing? And that's the direction in which uh, I'm going to, to move uh, next time. So a lot of it is not proved. Some is all what I described until now, which is harmonic analysis is OK. From next time, I'm going to enter a field where it's a lot of hand-waving arguments besides the result of large deviation that I will be citing where, uh, so I'll explain that. Okay, so thanks very much. Signed up for the Sunday selling trip, so you send it by mail. So if you change your mind, meaning that now you want to come and you can sign up for the Sunday, you don't want to sign again. Uh, 